Good evening, everyone. Masa el khair. Welcome to Malpa Music's second online concert. I am Heba Zafiriu Zarifi, Chair of Palm Music UK, Friends of the Edward Said National Conservatory of Music. Thank you all for connecting with us from many parts of the world during this Advent season to rejoice at the sight of the luminous star brightly shining in the sky, its overarching radiance leading us surely to love in the little town of Bethlehem in Palestine. To bring us closer to home, I have Bethlehem skyline as my backdrop. In the Northern Hemisphere, we're entering the winter solstice with the shortest period of daylight and longest night of the year. Yet in the midst of that deep darkness, a new hope is given to us, a new light is born to us. Of the babe in the manger, we are told about a miracle, a child beaming with light, speaking from the cradle, and by his spirit, meek and gentle, life is renewed so that each of us becomes a light, incandescent, gently burning with love, like the star. Tonight, we have with us three wonderful stellar musicians, Tala Tutunji on the piano, Laith Siddiq on the violin, and Tamir Sahuri on the oud, each shining brightly through their talent, giving us much joy and many good reasons to celebrate the birth of light in our world. Welcome Tala, Laith, and Tamir. Thank you. Ahlan wa sahlan. We are very pleased to have you with us to celebrate your creative journey to stardom. We also have another very special guest with us tonight, His Excellency, former ambassador Afif Safi, a resplendent galaxy unto himself with trajectories across the borders, each yet more luminous than the last. Ahlan wa sahlan, Afif. Thank you for accepting our invitation. We are honored to have you with us. From the Palm Music Committee, I'm joined by trustee and chair of projects, Wissam Bustani and director, Louisa Collins. I believe we have an audience of more than 300 tuning in, which is a token of our supporters' wonderful encouragement. Thank you all for being with us. And now, straight from Bethlehem, we welcome the Bethlehem Choir to open our musical evening with the silence and serenity of Christmas. We are very thankful for this recording made under hardship and strict lockdown with barely any time to rehearse. And for this, we are very appreciative. Let's welcome the Bethlehem Choir.
Thank you. That was lovely. Sung both in English and Arabic, accompanied on the piano by Wissam Assis. We will hear again from Bethlehem Choir at the end of our program. I'm very excited to introduce Tala Tutunji, whose musical talent, like a shooting star, bridges East and West musical traditions with the passion and flair of a rising star. Tala's latest performances took place at Medina Jumeirah Theater and Al Sirkal Avenue in Dubai. Tala was invited to represent Jordan at the Royal Palace of Naples under the patronage of Her Royal Highness, Princess Wijdan. Tala was the co-founder and director of the Chelsea Music Academy in London. She is currently the head of music at Al Jalila Cultural Center for Children in Dubai. Please join me in welcoming Tala Tutunji on the piano performing Dalauna by the composer Tar Yunus. Thank you. 
Stella, thank you so much. It's so nice to hear you after all these years. Alan was Alan. Thank you, Wissam. Thank you. Really nice. Before before I ask you some questions about about yourself, your music, uh, um, can you tell us a little bit about um, Dalaon and uh, Tariq Yunus's piece and how it came about? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I'll talk about first. Uh, I'll, uh, I'm going to speak first about Tariq Yunus. So Tariq Yunus, um, he's a Jordanian Palestinian composer, and he was born in Riyadh and then moved to Jordan. Uh, Tariq. Um, uh, started improvising piano at the age of 15, which was fascinating. And we both had the same piano teacher. So I watched him composing and improvising, and I watched this entire process of him doing so. And then he went to London to Trinity College of Music, where he actually won a lot of awards, uh, like the Adam Collins Award and the Chevening Scholarship and Qatan Foundation Scholarship and many things. And then he also uh, did his master's in the School of African and Oriental Studies. And uh, over there, like he did a lot of research and composition and education. And his compositions are so well known now, like in the region. And uh, they are very influential to so many people. And they capture our hearts because they combine like the, you know, the Arabic melodies that we know though they are kind of transformed into like major and minor scale. And at the same time, they've got this like um, Western contemporary, Western classical contemporary harmonies. So it's that mix of both that makes Tariq's pieces very special. And a lot of pieces, even when we performed his piece, Rising from the Ashes, I will never forget. A lot of people were actually tearing in the audience. So it really touches people's hearts, his compositions. And um, uh, he's also established the Amman Classical Music Society, and he's got so many things that he's done in the region. Great. Uh, yeah. As for uh, Ala Dalona, as you know, Ala Dalona is basically uh, this very beautiful dance and tune coming from the Levant. It's from the Huran. It originally came from Huran, which included like Syria, Jordan, Palestine, and Lebanon. And I actually did a lot of research and a friend of mine who's a poet, Samir Rimouni, gave me a lot of insight on the background of Ala Dalona. And I found that very interesting because it really ties with his piece. So Ala Dalona um, speaks about, uh, it's basically a call. So somebody would call the neighborhood in the villages of the Levant that calls out for help to their people to come and uh, reform the roofs of the houses. At that time, they were made of rocks and uh, the roofs were made of mud and wood. So they would perform this dance on the roof because they are trying to reform the roof and help one another. So it's got this kind of social interaction and community experience. And through their uh, footsteps of Dabka, they created various rhythms. So it's this social interaction as this process of creating different tunes. So they would kind of like improvise uh, using poetry, using different texts, or even just improvise texts of their daily life and themes of love. So I think Hala Dal Ola is very kind of significant to a lot of people. And uh, in his piece, when Tariq did his piece, uh, basically what I found very fascinating is that uh, he was basically influenced by the old parts of Amman. So when he went to the old parts of Jordan, that kind of inspired him uh, uh, to write and actually will say manipulate the tune. So the composer manipulates the tune in various ways. So each time you see that the tune appears in a different way. Sometimes it's kind of this like slow section where you can improvise a little bit. And then there's this big chord sections, which, the, the, you know, it symbolizes like the grand feeling of the Levant and the kind of majestic feeling. And the, the Western classical contemporary harmonies uh, accompanied with the Levantine rhythms makes it very fascinating. So like, I feel I totally belong here because the melody in the right hand is kind of being manipulated. And at the same time, the, the left hand is doing like various rhythms, uh, various Levantine rhythms and different harmonies every time. And it feels like 
a surprise every time he manipulates the melody. And um, so basically it, he turns it into this fantasy for solo piano. And it's a reflection of how he felt and a reflection on how he felt on the tune Ala Dal Ona. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, I didn't know all this and it, uh, it, it, it helps me understand Tari and Darona more. Uh, ever since I've known you, Tala, when you were living in London, you've always been championing new music and music that's kind of crosses cultures. How did that start? I mean, um, has it always been like this or were there one or two events that, that shaped this departure for you? Well, it started, you know, since childhood, because although I never met my granddad, but I was always hearing stories about my grandfather feeling very strongly about the Levant region and writing various articles on how fascinated he is with the Levant. And I was doing Western classical music and by watching Tare, who was also having the same piano teacher, I was looking at uh, Rula Nabil, who is a piano, he's a, she's a pianist. and she took like a long time to prepare his pieces. And she was telling me, Tala, it takes so long to prepare Tariq's pieces as if it's Chopin or Brahms. <laughs> so it took, it made me, at that time, I started feeling a very strong sense of belonging because my surroundings are encouraging me to feel this sense of belonging. And at the same time, there's this kind of Western classical feeling to it. And also moving to London, because I was born in Jordan and then moving to London. And then when I was in London, there was this whole scope of, uh, like I met many Arabic composers actually in London. Many of them were trained in a Western classical way. And uh, the first event that we started was with Arab Media Watch and it was Al Hurriya one, so Freedom One. And I actually felt a great sense of freedom doing that. Uh, and I brought some of my friends and musicians who were in Trinity College of Music and a lot of other musicians. So it's this lovely collaborations between musicians in London and musicians from Jordan. I brought some musicians from Jordan and I felt like by meeting those composers, oh my God, there's so many things. There's like, I have to at least put them into one recital. So we did it in one recital and we started like with, let's say, from the Andalusian to the modern times. And I, even when I went to the Andalusian music and let's say the Moshahat, for example, composers like uh, Abdul Hamid Hamam, he already did uh, like different canon attempts and uh, arrangements for different Moshahat, not just Lama Bayt Athanna, but there was one like Badat Min Al Khidri. I felt like, oh my God, this canon is so beautiful. And then it just kind of developed. So by meeting the different composers like Bushra at Turk and uh, in London, like um, Tariq Yunus um, and many others, it really brought a lot of light. And I remember uh, uh, seeing you also, and you kind of inspired me. And then we did Al Athir uh, event, which was also uh, uh, dedicated to uh, people in Palestine. And when we did al Athir, we performed the uh, Rising from the Ashes. And then from there, I started feeling a sense of belonging to those pieces because they combined both of best worlds, the Western classical, contemporary, and the Arabic. Great, great, so, thanks. Yeah. I remember those concerts very well. Um, uh, <laughs> so you're living now in Dubai. Can you tell us a little bit about life, musical, cultural life in Dubai? Kind of what are, uh, the local projects happening and what sort of connections Dubai and you personally might have with uh, the Edward Said Conservatory of Music in Palestine. Okay, I know so there's, uh, yeah. I think we have had many projects in the Emirates uh, over the years. So I, uh, there's a lot of, uh, since I moved to Dubai, uh, there is a, a, a very interesting cultural scene and there's a lot of people who are very much willing to connect and collaborate like the Dubai Opera, the Circal Avenue, uh, the Emirates Festival of Literature. I remember composing music with a team of musicians just to compose music for their opening. So that was really lovely. Um, and uh, there's many, many other uh, places for collaboration here. Al Jalila Cultural Center uh, for Children and um, um, like, as I said, the Dubai Opera, uh, there's a cinema performing arts. So I met, uh, I also collaborating with uh, uh, the choreographer and dancer Ala 
and like now we're planning a project together which includes music and dance so we did a, there's a big cultural scene in dubai and a lot of them are open to collaboration and music that includes this cross-cultural fusion um and the, you know that's why it's really nice and uh, their connection with the Edward Said Foundation. I mean, we. I'm very much uh, willing to uh, collaborate with them and meet more Palestinian musicians and do various recordings or projects or workshops. You know, we're open to collaboration always. Great. Now, one last question. Um, can you share with us some of your kind of long-term aspirations as a musician, maybe per, on a personal level as well? You're just looking forward. How, where do you sense it's all going? Yes, um, see, it's actually those Arabic composers which I met and that have classical influence that have really inspired me to start that. So composers like Piras Rida, the Syrian composer, and Bushra El Turk, which has a lot of witty compositions. So by meeting the different characters that I know, such as Tariq Yunus, who has like reflections on his life in Amman, and Firas Rida, who's a wonderful Syrian composer and also has a very interesting uh, sense of harmony and very nice interpretation. And uh, by meeting uh, composers such as um, um, and Nabil bin Abdul Jalil and many other composers, which I know, I feel like each composer has a narrative. So this drives me to my aspirations. I would love to, uh, well, first of all, I'm going to release an album that includes uh, all the stuff that I do. So the Western classical music, uh, some music influenced by Aziz and Mustafa in Turkey, and also uh, music by contemporary Arabic composers. Uh, but what I'm really planning to do uh, is to create a creative documentary. Uh, and this creative documentary will basically highlight the narrative of those composers because, you know, rehearsing with them it's one thing playing their piece, but it's one thing really rehearsing with them and seeing things behind the scene. Because seeing things behind the scene, I'm exploring a lot of like musical interpretation with them and I'm being inspired by their stories. And how sometimes when some pieces have few notes and then when you meet the composer, oh my God, like the interpretation needs so much and actually needs so much imagination and it needs different colors, different colors of sounds and the tone quality. And there's so many things that it actually needs. So I would love to do this creative documentary that highlights their narrative and uh, speaks about our region. And also through those interviews, I would love to travel and meet different composers and musicians because I'm not only intending to do it for solo piano. So I'm intending to collaborate with different musicians whether it's trained players or woodwind or what have you. And through performing, I would love to do this behind the scene images and videos and then come up with a story that highlights the beautiful elements that, well, that we I have. Think that's, that's beautiful because really the watching the process of music making is almost more enlightening than the concert itself because you see how it, it's growing from the inside. Tala, I'm really sorry, but that's, that's all we have time for. It's so nice to see you shining so brightly as ever. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's so wonderful to talk to a wonderful musician like yourself. We are very lucky and we feel very inspired. Thank you. <laughs> hey, thank you, Tala and we, Sam. That was an incredible performance. And, uh, and the much loved theme of Dal'ona, yani which means the one who comes to, to our aid, like a rose emerges from the depth of the earth and then elusively disappears, leaving her lingering scent through the classical and jazz parts of the music. Again, Tala, thank you so much for this very beautiful interpretation. Thank you so much, Hilda. Thank you. And now, live from Palestine, let's welcome Tamer Sahouri. Tamer is the academic director of the Edward Said National Conservatory of Music. He also heads the Arabic Music Department at the Conservatory. Tamir has founded the musical group Wajd at Bethlehem University. He is a renowned composer and oud player. The oud is one of the world's most ancient surviving instruments 
and Tama's love of the Oud from the age of eight developed brightly. And like comets that are visible to the naked eye, his art shines in concerts and music festivals, whether in Palestine, Europe, Africa, or the United States. Today, he will be performing two pieces, both his composition. Let's hear Tamir on the Oud with an orchestra of students and teachers from the Edward Said Conservatory. The piece is called Al Ghurba, difficult to translate in English, but it means something along the lines of being in a foreign land and not feeling quite at home. Here is Tamir and the orchestra.
Tamir, أهلا وسهلا. أهلا, thank you. Thanks for joining us from Bethlehem, uh, and I believe you're in the in the conservatory building now. Yes. Yes. Welcome here. Um, uh, I've I've known you only for a few months on Zoom, but I feel that we've become very very close um, since you took over as the head of academics um, at, at the conservatory um, for the whole conservatory in all five branches. I think. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the challenges and the successes that you've had with the students and the teachers over the last months uh, at at the conservatory? Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, definitely, this year wasn't uh, that easy as I took over as the academic uh, director position in such difficult and exceptional time. We have encountered a lot of challenges, but most importantly, that due to the pandemic and the closure of the airports, our foreign teachers for particular instruments couldn't make it to Palestine. But fortunately, we have previous experience uh, with online teaching, as we have a branch on Gaza, and our teachers cannot reach there. And we proceeded with our online courses despite the situation, as we were the first institution to give online courses from the first day of the pandemic. Uh, moreover, uh, some of the students and teachers has been impacted by COVID-19, which has uh, caused uh, change in the academic programs to cope with the current situation, in addition to the quarantine every while and then by the authority. In addition to the usual uh, harassment and disturbment by the occupation, as was as what recently happened with uh, Mr. Suhail and his wife, uh, Rania Elias, uh, as the Israeli occupation has arrested them and confiscated the uh, computers and files, aiming at narrowing uh, the work and if the effect of the cultural institutions in Jerusalem and obliterate the Palestinian identity. On the other hand, we have succeeded uh, in uh, opening uh, new instrument sections in some branches and developing the Arabic singing department. We also provided an affordable music programs and conducted schools competition to obtain scholarships to encourage uh, the talents to start uh, learning uh, music. Great, great, thank you. Um, for, this, for, the, for the children who are studying, I think it's very important that they hear their teachers performing, that, that they see their teachers taking the risks that you are encouraging them to to take on in pursuit of becoming better people and learning. How has becoming the director of academics uh, affected your performance, the way you work and, and, and the way you teach? Um, has anything changed since you've taken on this new role? Uh, I strive to balance between my administrative uh, responsibilities and my music from playing, uh, practicing and uh, composing as I need uh, regular uh, practice, as I still teach uh, and follow up my students who reach the highest uh, levels and they will uh, graduate soon. In addition, I still coordinate and play with the Jilan uh, ensembles and the Arabic music orchestra that we have uh, recently formed. Uh, the academic director position is very sensitive and I believe that my musical activities will inspire and influence all the ES and CM students in all branches. It definitely because we teach by example, not that we want people to copy us, but when they see us take a risk, they are more encouraged to take risks themselves. That's the only reason. So um, you come in contact with a lot of students and teachers. Um, what do you feel are the strengths and weaknesses of musical life in, in Palestine? Um, just give, paint a picture of where things are at at the moment in relation to culture and music in Palestine and what that represents for the wider world also, because we represent um, uh, the a human face for Palestine as well. Please, I would love to hear your, your views on this. Palestine is known by its musical culture. We have traditional music and songs for every occasion you have may think of. Our traditional folk dance is present in all cultural events all over the world. We may recall Muhammad Ghazi, Silfador Arnita, Yahya al Riyad al-Bandak, Simon Shaheen. They have influenced a lot of talents. 
and their music is alive till uh, now. Even though we didn't have music conservatories 30 years ago, but the existence of music have created high competent musicians uh, who are able to teach and represent Palestinian music everywhere. Our main strength, I think, is the community awareness about uh, the importance of music in our lives and on, on children in part particular, as music has its way to enhancing the children's character, behavior, and strengthen their characters, personality, and create the rooted bond with our history and culture. Unfortunately, the obstacles imposed by the occupation have prevented our musicians to participate in several festivals uh, inside and outside Palestine due to travel permissions and visas. The hard economic situation in Palestine deprived a lot of children and talents to learn music, but we seek to provide scholarships uh, to, to a number to the, uh, of the talented students as much as we can. But due to this pandemic and politically conditional funding, a huge portion of external support we received has stopped and we couldn't provide scholarships as we uh, used to be. In general, we may say that music and arts is our nonviolent weapon. We use to address our case to the world despite all the obstacles. We are full of hope and we love life. We have the right to live like other people, we will continue to teach music to our children to keep uh, the journey and create a generation that adhere its heritage and its land. Well, I think that's very, very beautiful. Uh, Tamer, um, can we listen to your next piece? Can you describe it a little bit for us while I prepare it? The other piece is uh, improvisation uh, uh, on Maqam uh, Rahat Al Arwah. It's an Arabic uh, uh, old uh, maqam, and uh, it has like many changes in, uh, inside the improvisation itself between uh, uh, many kinds of other maqams uh, in it. Thank you, Tamir. It's been a privilege working with you on the LDL program with the children. Thank you for all the love that you're giving to everyone. Thank you.
والله الله حبيبي ثانك يو ثانك يو تامر ذات واز ابسولوتلي بيوتيفول برفورمانس اند ذا امبروفايزيشن اون مقام راحت الادواح واز ترولي سولفول اي وود ايفن ساي ميستيكال ثانك يو تامر اند وي ويش يو اول ذا بيست ان يور كارير از ا كومبوزر اند وذ يور نيو ريسبونسابيلتيز ات ذا كونسرفاتوري ثانك يو ثانك يو تامر Now I would like to give a big welcome to our special guest, former Ambassador Afif Safi. Afif, you are an accomplished diplomat with a vastly sophisticated background. You have been a roving ambassador and like the movements of heavenly bodies in the galaxies, you have gained great insights into how the world of politics works. I will list a few of your voyages on planet Earth. You were the PLO representative to the Netherlands, head of the Palestinian delegation to the UK, first ambassador to the Vatican's Holy See. You were Palestinian ambassador to the Russian Federation, head of the Palestinian mission in Washington DC, as well as a visiting scholar at Harvard University. The wondrous list goes on. but there is one facet that our audience might not know about you your sense of humor <laughs> so if you don't mind i would like us to start our conversation with one of your jokes and some laughter what is the difference between ambassador and a camel The camel can work for 10 days without drinking, but an ambassador can drink for 10 days without working. <laughs> but I was closer to a moderately drinking camel. <laughs> And whilst I know you drink very modestly, I, I don't believe you have ever stopped working and in very difficult context to establish dialogue essential for building peace and to promote healthy alliances to benefit a just resolution to unjust conditions. Ambassador Safi, ahlan wa sahlan. We are delighted to welcome you to Palm Music. It's a privilege to be with you this evening, and I'm so delighted to see so much talent, gifted musicians performing in front of a, an international audience. Thank you for everything you've been doing. Ahlan. So, may I ask you, wise man of the East, What was the guiding star that brought you to serve your country so tirelessly? And do you think that if each of us followed our own star, following the journey we must embark on as we seek our destiny, do you think it will lead us to Bethlehem? You know, during the Napoleonic Wars that devastated continental Europe, the Swiss had a proverb and the Swiss had succeeded in remaining neutral. And the proverb said, les peuples heureux n'ont pas d'histoire. Happy peoples have no history. And uh, we, the Palestinian people, we are either blessed or burdened and plagued with too much history, too much theology, too much mythology, and very little geography. You know, we are at the intersection of three important continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. And we have been at the center of events throughout history, history between Mesopotamia and Pharaonic Egypt, the rise of Greece and the domineering Rome and beyond. So we've been at the center of international relations for throughout the centuries. And in the 20th century, we became the victims of the victims of European history. And as a result, we never got our fair share of sympathy, understanding and solidarity. And for us Palestinians, in a way, politics was a necessary evil. It uh, influenced, it invaded our life, and it occupied all our existence. Uh, and as you know, we have suffered uh, three successive denials. We have been denied our mere physical existence, the theory of Palestine, a land without a people for a people without a land. We have been denied our rights, national and individual. We have been denied the recognition of our suffering. Nakba denial is as abominable and atrocious and uh, nauseating as all other historical denials. 
And the, recently, the new Israeli ambassador in London, who is a right wing, extreme right wing from Israel, who created discomfort within the Jewish British community, by the way, because of her political positions, she said that the Nakba was one Arab big lie. Nakba denial is atrocious. You know, we have become the Jews of the Israelis, and uh, we have always suffered from no a sort of selective indignation. Yeah? Our victims would die, but as and would pass unnoticed to international public opinion because the mainstream media wouldn't speak about it, as though our victims were nameless, fatherless, motherless, childless, worthless, and we should not get resigned to that fact. Uh, I believe those who chose to be our enemies have mobilized against us. God, the Bible, Hitler, the Holocaust, Hollywood. And believe you me, this is a monumental historical challenge that we have to face. Yet I, am, I always remain hopeful and I believe that all the optimists make history, not the pessimists. And we should not allow pessimism to invade our psyche. And some of us uh, recently have elevated pessimism to the level of, as though it was the criteria of measurement of one's patriotism. That's not the case, it's a self-castrating attitude. Optimism, hope is the vehicle of making history and moving forward. Uh, I believe that uh, Palestine-Israel has always been a test between political courage and moral cowardice. And I hope that our rendezvous with history, with courage is not in the too distant future. And, the fact that the Palestinian problems remains unresolved, it shows that we are witnessing a failure of diplomacy, a failure of international law being implemented. And this is why I say it's the interest of the international community to see justice and peace restored to the Middle East, because it is the test for the international community. And I believe the international will should prevail on a national whim. Peace is too important to be left to the Israelis to decide upon. So I remain hopeful. Bethlehem, Jerusalem, from where we belong, is a place where the message of peace and love emanated and emerged. And you know, you, you and I, we come from Jerusalem. Uh, I, in the biggest of moments, remained confident that Palestine will resurrect. And as you know, we have had some previous experience in resurrection. Thank you, Afif. I agree with you. And I would like to add that if we are denied our history, we are also denied our roots. In our program today, we have musicians who celebrate otherness, by which I mean a harmonious encounter of East and West, a fusion of both Eastern and Western musical traditions. To the clash of civilizations that many choose to describe our world, respond by demonstrating there is no clash at all. Quite the contrary, there is integration, whereby the music we have in our program today is woven with the most authentic and much loved Arabic melody in dialogue with Western classical music and a touch of jazz. This drives me to ask you to address how colonialist occupation, unlike cooperation, destroys the other by making them other, with whom we cannot coexist. Can you say a few words about this from your experience in political life and as a Palestinian from Al-Quds, Jerusalem? You know, I, I personally believe that there is a concept in international relations that never took off the ground. And it's the concept of global tribes. Uh, and today, we, the Palestinians, uh, have become a global tribe. Uh, the Jews are a global tribe. The Armenians are a global tribe. The Chinese are a global tribe. The Irish are a global tribe. But we, the Palestinians, the Jews of the Israelis, have become a global tribe. You run into Palestinians from Scandinavia to Pennsylvania to California to Australia. This is the symptom of our tragedy. We are scattered in the four corners of the world because of our expulsion from our homeland. In the future, if we are smart and we can be smart, it can become a source of political empowerment. And today we are a global tribe uh, present in the USA, for example, which is the major political arena where our battle for independence and statehood would be either won or lost. 
And I'm so happy to see that uh, our community is increasingly integrated and playing an important role and a vocal visible role. Uh, I believe in the cross fertilization of civilization, in the dialogue of civilization. And I believe that the concept of the clash of civilization is horrible and it has provoked polarization and uh, mobilization on ethnic and religious grounds, which I totally abhor. I believe we Palestinians are universalists. We belong to Palestine where the spiritual messages uh, emerged and we are the custodians of those spiritual messages. And I believe in the cross civilization of cultures and uh, civilizations. And the fact that we are scattered all over the world means that we have interacted we have studied as Palestinians from Paris, pa Paris to Palestine, from Harvard to Harare. And that's beautiful because so many experiences we have integrated in our national journey. Uh, so I'm hopeful for the future. We need to be on the level of the challenges we have to cope with and to face. And uh, uh, the fact that we are a global tribe today, uh, the interests of humanity and our interests are now one. We are affected by fires in Australia and in California. We are uh, uh, affected by pandemics that are regional or global. Uh, we are very interested in the climate uh, discussion and debate. Why? Because we are there from Chile to Sweden, uh, you find Palestinians and they are touched. So our enlightened national interest and the interests of humanity as a whole are interrelated and we live in an interdependent world and we are a global tribe who believes in the cross fertilization of cultures and civilization and not in the clash and the necessary unavoidable conflict. Thank you, Afif, that was inspirational. And I believe because we are rooted in our own traditions, we are open to universal values. My last question to you, Afif, is this. Um, we are seeing phase after phase, the appropriation of Palestinian land, houses, history, and archeology span by the colonizing power and the perpetual destruction of Palestinian human and political rights stage by stage. What hopes do you think we can hold on to in this bleak time of history? Is a reversal possible given the amnesia of the political powers at play toward our desolate condition of living in exodus, some more than others, denied the right to return to our beloved Palestine, denied the basic right to have a place on this earth to call home? You know, in the play Galileo, uh, there is a beautiful scene where uh, Galile Galileo is shown to have been pressured by the Inquisition through violence and torture to retract his findings about the, the earth and the globe. And in that scene in the play, uh, a disciple of uh, Galileo says, un un unhappy are the people who have no heroes because he's so disappointed that his mentor Galileo has caved into pressure. To which Galileo answers by saying, no, my friend, Unhappy are the people who have no heroes. Unfortunately, we, the Palestinian people, we still have a need for heroes. And the hero is the collective Palestinian people who has shown that they have a capacity for endurance of suffering and pain beyond description. I am hopeful for the future because history is not static. And I believe that there are several elements that can give us hope for the future, among others, the changes that have occurred in the last two decades in the American scene. Uh, to give you one example, my wife and I, we were in America for three years when we were posted in Washington. And we have lectured in 30 different states. And our message was the following. In a world which is unipolar, uh, some say we are now entering multipolarity, but the world has a dominant country, which is the USA. A siding, America siding with one belligerent player in a regional conflict is detrimental to the American interest. Why? Because it antagonizes thus all the other players in the region, but it also 
antagonizes, offends, and ghettoizes a domestic component of the American society. Because America, as you know, is a nation of nations. And uh, it hasn't been easy to be a Palestinian American, an Arab American, or a Muslim American during the last six, seven decades because of this feeling that your country of adoption is not sensitive to the sufferings of your countries of origin. So I believe there is a trend now in America wanting to be more even-handed, to play the role of the honest broker. And within the Democratic Party, which is now going to be in power, uh, Arab voices have become very visible and are listened to. And more importantly also, within the American Jewish community, there is a process of maturation. And many are feeling very uncomfortable with the Israeli misbehavior. And as you know, for example, Netanyahu has sided with Republican candidates for the presidency, while 70% and more of the American Jewish community have sided with the Democratic candidates. So they are not on the same wavelength anymore. Many feel uncomfortable. And in American campus campuses, Jewish American students are with Arab American students lobbying now for a more even-handed American approach to Middle Eastern realities. So I believe we, the Palestinians, should keep our social and political cohesion, improve the performance of the institutions that represent us, repair the damaged political structure because of the split we have suffered from. And I believe one can be hopeful for the future because history is not static. You know, Hegel has once said that from history, we learn that we have not learned from history. I believe he wouldn't mind if you and I were to prove him wrong, at least on this one. Hiba, it was a privilege to be with you in this program, and I'm sure that your audience would love to listen again to your talented, gifted musician. Uh, I feel thank you so much. You know, I believe that it, it, it takes a poem and a music to bring us home. Meanwhile, we keep Palestine in our hearts so we can celebrate Christmas in Bethlehem. Thank you, Afif. Your contribution today, again, impresses on me how your name, Safi, which we say in Arabic to describe the clarity and purity of water, how much your name, Isma Ala Musamma, is a wonderful description of the clarity of your thought and the purity of love for Palestine in your heart. And just to round it off, do you have another joke up your sleeve you can share with us? You know, I was a diplomat and not a stand-up comedian, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, not mischievously, after the Oslo breakthrough in 1993, I told my Norwegian friends that if the Oslo process has not yet put Palestine fully on the map, it has put Norway on the map because everybody was uh, intrigued how a small country could play such an important role disproportionate with its geographic size and its demographic weight. And often when talking to European officials, I would tell them, Europe is still an actor in search for a role. And we in the Middle East have a role in search for an actor. If we could merge the role in search of an actor and the actor in search of a role, we will all live less unhappily ever after. And let me tell you, I believe personally that we have suffered in the quest for peace from what I call the self-inflicted impotence of the international community. Uh, the international community left the two belligerent sides, asymmetrical sides, to sort it out by themselves, intervening very little except in political declarations. I believe actors in the international system should be accountable to the highest possible standards. And I believe that the world like us should consider that occupation is inadmissible, unacceptable, and should be terminated. And I believe that the pro-Israeli inquisition that frightens many a, a group and uh, individuals should be confronted intellectually and politically. And it is inadmissible to succumb to the pressures of the pro-Israeli inquisition. And I use the word inquisition, and I hope nobody would be offended. I, I am a Roman Catholic who graduated with grand distinction from the most oldest 
Catholic University, the, uh, the Catholic University of Louvain, and the Inquisition was a Roman Catholic phenomenon. So I can use the concept of Inquisition the way I want in the most responsible manner. Thank you, Afi. It was wonderful to have you with us. And thank you for all your insights and for giving us hope and, and a way I, forward. And I leave you with and our horrible musicians. Thank you, Afi. And on that note, um, we continue with a variation on a theme of Follow the Star with our young students performing from various branches of the conservatory. Like a garland of blooming stars, they brighten our night sky with their softly burning fire. From Ramallah, we welcome Reem Malki, who is studying the Oud under Ibrahim Khalil Najm. She will perform Zikrayati, My Memories, one of the most famous songs of Um Kalthum and composed by one of the leading Egyptian composers, Bravo, Reem. That was beautiful, beautiful setup. And the composer is Muhammad Al Qasabji. Again, from Ramallah branch, we have Wissam Faris on the buzu performing Sama'i Nahawand, composed by Mas'ud Jamil. Wissam's teacher, Tariq Abushi, is a master of Taqasim on the buzuk. So let's listen to Wissam on the buzuk with Sama'i Nahawand. Thank you. 
Ah, here we sound. That was beautiful. Brilliant. Well done. Um, our third performer from Bethlehem branch is the highly talented pianist Ali Hayyan, studying under Julia Hager. He will be playing for us Sergei Prokofiev's Suggestion Diabolique. Here is Ali on the piano. Hey everyone, my name is Ali. I like to play the piano. I also write songs and arrange some modern music in my free time. As a piano student, I spend a good deal of my day practicing alone. And during these hard times we were going through, I had the chance to utilize quarantine for a more fruitful and creative isolation. Um, that's by practicing more, exploring, listening to classical works that I wasn't aware of. Uh, of course I miss socializing with other people, but I had the chance to have a lot of time to put into music, which made me improve a lot and made me feel better about myself and my music. I'm going to be playing for coffee suggestions Diabolic. Well done, Ali. Fantastic. <laughs> Incredibly intense and exhilarating performance. Thank you. 
Um, lastly, with us from Gaza, we welcome Rima Ashour on the Nay, accompanied by Iyad Abu Layla on the Rak, performing Longa Shahnaz by the composer Adham Effendi. Rima has been studying under Osama, Osama Jahjouh from Gaza branch. Yalla Rima. What a joyous finale. Thank you, Rima and Iyad. And thank you to all our students and their teachers at the SNCM. Thank you. I'm delighted to introduce you to Laith Sadiq. Laith is an award-winning violinist, composer, and educator who has been featured on multiple award-winning albums and has performed with some of the top people in the industry. His journey resembles that of meteor showers with sparks and flickers ignited throughout his journey. Completing his master's degree at the Berkeley Global Jazz Institute, he won second place at the Zbigniew Seifert International Jazz Violin Competition. Following a rigorous musical training, Leith is now focused on expanding the role of the violin in different musical genres. Working with educational institutions like Carnegie Hall and others, to help introduce Arabic music into classroom curriculums in the US, as well as making Arabic music more accessible through the use of social media. From being a musician, Naith is now respected as an artist. In my view, this meteor is in fact a star, but Naith corrected me by saying he'd rather be described as a humble comet. Let's welcome Naith Sadiq, who will play for us Bachawand. This is an interpretation of Johann Sebastian Bach's Allemande from his second partita for solo violin in D minor, viewed from the perspective of Maqam Nahawand. Off you go.
Thank you. Leif, absolutely spellbinding, absolutely spellbinding. Um, mm -hmm. Before we start to, to get into your mind a little bit and um, um, participate in, in your journey, we just heard that you won an award recently, the Boston Music Award, uh, like in the last two days. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank Can you, really you tell us a little bit about this uh, new award and what it means? And Absolutely. This award is, uh, of course, uh, from Boston, Massachusetts in the United States, where I've been living for the past 10 years. And they have different categories. Uh, the one that I was part of was the best international artist for the year 2020. And I was nominated as, uh, you know, a committee voted on different names to nominate them. And I was thankful to be on the nomination, you know, category. And then the audience voted for 75% of the award and the committee for 25%. And I was thankful to have won that category. And, you know, it, it, it's really an award validates the hard work that you do and what you pour your heart into a community. And my work in the United States and around the world, whether it's to do with Arabic music or education in general, has been really for uh, the mission of preserving this music and making sure that we highlight the the power of music in a society. And this award coming to me maybe as a performer, but I really see it as encompassing everything that I have been doing for the past 10 years in Boston. So it's a, a really, really big honor. Great, great. Well, Mabruk, really, we're so Thank proud you. of you. And it's like, we almost feel like your success is a little bit our success too. Thank you. Thank I, you. Hope you I, I hope you understand what I mean. Absolutely. So, can you please uh, tell us, um, uh, you're improvising on the violin, uh, what effect it's had on your music making generally, whether you're playing composed music or not, uh, and when did, when did you actually start improvising? Mm. So I, as you heard in the performance of the Bach um, partita, I grew up uh, at the conservatory learning Western classical, Western European music. So improvisation was not a really important or integral part of my upbringing in that style, when it really should be, because when you look at someone like Johann Sebastian Bach, he was improvising 90% of the time. And, but I was, you know, really disciplined in making sure I work on the notation exactly as it's written and so on. So we all know, Usam, of course, you know exactly what I mean. And, but there was a moment when I was, um, I think I was about 10 years old or nine, I was in my bedroom at, in, in Amman, in Jordan, I was practicing my Bach or my scales. And then I heard the call to prayer from the mosque. And the Mu'addin, the Imam was reciting in Maqam Hijaz, which is one of the Maqamat that we have in Arabic music, the melodic frameworks, as we call them. And I was so, you know, I've heard it all my life because I grew up there. But that moment with the instrument in my hand, I thought, oh, I can actually play this. It's not just a foreign or a sound that's coming from somewhere outside, but it's something from within. And it wasn't really a religious experience. It was really just a musical experience in that moment. And I started to copy these sounds and I thought, wow, I can create things that are not written down. So that was one of those like oh, light bulb moments. Um, and improvisation has been part of my life ever since going to Berkeley, making that journey. Um, and studying at the Berkeley Global Jazz Institute, as you know, jazz music is also influenced by improvisation as well as Arabic music as well. So my journey has kind of steadily been growing more towards improvised music, but not doesn't mean that it has to be random music. Improvisation com is coming from composition too, and it's coming from learned repertoire. So I think it's just a, a, a journey that, that sent me into that path. And I always say thank you to my Western European or classical musical upbringing that it gave me such a foundation to be able to explore improvisation so freely today. Well, that's beautiful. And, you know, maybe coming to it a little bit later has made you appreciate it even more. And by the way, it might, well, I think it was a religious experience when you were 10 years old. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe. It wasn't just a musical experience. It was an experience that shook you to the ground and you saw yourself in a new way and we can see into you through that experience. Mm. If uh, religion doesn't do that, then, well, I don't know what religion is, frankly. Um, so, uh, listen, um, uh, I want you to tell us a little bit, you know, I met you for the first time about four years ago when the Palestine Youth Orchestra came to the UK on their six city tour, and you were leading the orchestra. 
Can you briefly uh, tell us about your experience leading orchestras? I don't know how much orchestra playing you do. Can you talk a little bit about the differences in, in what you do in, in terms of your composing and your improvising and the discipline it takes to lead a classically trained orchestra? Well, I should add that my, you know, my upbringing in the musical world, especially in orchestras, was mainly at, with the Palestine Youth Orchestra. I, I went there for the first time. I was very young. I was 13 or something like that. And our generation of that age, Jana Barghouti, Nasim Al-Atrash, many people that I have, remember their names, good friends of mine today, we grew up in that orchestra. So to come to lead it about four years ago was such a one of these moments when things come full circle. And I thought, what a great responsibility and privilege to be able to lead these fantastic young players who are my friends and my family. And unfortunately, I don't do much orchestra playing today because my path has shifted to more smaller ensemble playing, more chamber music, live, um, improvisational music. But I have a, a strong love for orchestra playing, the discipline of it, the idea of playing with so, so many people on stage and being one on stage. And, I never forget moments on stage with the Palestine Youth Orchestra when we'd be rehearsing for weeks and weeks, and then we'd come on stage and play this piece of music. And there's in the notation sheet, you would find a measure or a bar where we all put a heart because it's this chord or this harmony moment that is so beautiful that we all share this love for. So it's really a, a strong feeling of community that I, I truly miss uh, playing in. But I, I think I, I'm drawn away now from the idea of playing a piece of music the same way every single time or doing it the same exact way every single time. I'd like there to be some kind of change every night, which is something that is usually uncommon in orchestras, maybe more so today than it was maybe when I was I younger. Think, I think this is something that is evolving in orchestral playing. I agree with you. Now yeah. life never repeats itself. And the day we feel that life is, is just a copy, today is a copy of yesterday, is a day that we die inside Absolutely. and and music should represent this this feeling otherwise we become we we were like walking dead you know um finally um can you share with us your long-term aspirations musically personally and maybe for our broken planet you know what do you see your music as representing in the grand scheme of things as a comet yeah well, I do believe that as uh, Tamar was talking about education, I think education is the strongest thing we have. And I've been privileged to have really good education growing up. My, both my parents are musicians going to conservatory, to Cheatham School of Music, which we're both alumni of, uh, and in Manchester, UK, and finally at Berkeley. And I think I have a responsibility to give back. And I do believe that specifically with the theme of Arabic music, and this is, encompasses all Arabic music from the Gulf, to the Levant, Egypt, North Africa, is that we have such a powerful record of performances in this music, but much less documentation and much less um, educational material to really portray it. So that's been part of my mission as a performer. That doesn't mean that I'm just an educator, that I'm going to be teaching in a university all the time, but using performance as an educational tool. So whether going to universities, going to colleges, presenting an evening of music, but then also meeting the students and talking about how this music felt to them, what do these things mean, how to build that bridge and connect these things. And I've been thankful and fortunate to be doing this work with Carnegie Hall this past summer of really introducing Arabic music to the curriculum uh, of uh, classrooms in the US. So a lot of students grow up learning about music from, from Europe, from Germany, from Mozart, Bach, Italy and France and so on, but not really about other things around. So. I think those are my really long-term aspirations and I'm also been getting more used to social media and, and putting more content out there to do with this music that to hopefully engage more people about what is the importance of using music really as a tool for social for positive social change and I think we've been seeing that in the conservatory in Palestine whether it's in Gaza and Bethlehem or in, in Jerusalem how you know it's really showing students that what opportunities there are with music and how music can give you the tools to become successful in whatever career that you choose and that's why I am very happy also to be supporting and being here in this fundraiser. I think it's super important. Well, you know, strength to you and all your dreams because you make you make the war the world a warmer place. Uh, can you introduce us your second piece, uh, please, while I get prepared? Absolutely. The second piece is a song, and I I'm not a singer, but I do really love singing because it's such a great way to transmit emotions much quicker, I think, than just any other instrument. Singing the human voice, is there's something special there. 
This is an Iraqi song that I grew up listening to called Che Mali Wali, which means I don't have, the title means I don't have anyone to care for me. So it's one of those uh, songs that have some kind of heartbreak in them. And I wanted to, this was during the quarantine period back in April or May, somewhere around there, where I wanted to record the song and record it on my own. So the video is uh, recorded by myself and my wife using an iPhone, as you'll see. Um, and the recording was done along with my great friend, uh, Fadi Saba, on the fantastic pianist accompanying me. Um, so here is uh, Che Mali Wali. Thank you. Thank you, Leith. That was an amazing performance with Bahawan filmed in the gardens, reminding us of those ancient gardens of Nahawan. And Chimali Wali was haunting with so much dignity and presence. Thank you, Thank you Leith. It was Thank absolutely you. sublime. Thank you. My pleasure. Now the floor is open to you, our audience, to pose any questions you'd like to ask our musicians. Um, over to you, Louisa. Thank you very much, Heba. This is a wonderful, wonderful event. I'd like to firstly say thank you to everyone who was involved here. Our chat box has been very active throughout the session, full of a lot of love and praise for your wonderful performances and awards as well. So um, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time left for questions, but we'd like to just get to at least one for each of you. So the first question goes to Tala, and this question is from Sefa Hutt. It's actually two questions. So her first part of her question 
Sefa would like to know, Tala, where is your grandfather from? And also, where did you get your musical inspiration from? Okay, my grandfather is uh, Dr. Jamil Tutunji. I'm very proud of him, though I've never met him, but I see a lot of videos about him until nowadays, from 1980 until now, I see videos about him every day. And he was um, the Minister of Health in Jordan, and he was the ambassador of Jordan in uh, Russia, and he had many achievements in Jordan as a doctor and made a difference in people's lives. And he had a lot of journals written about the Levant and how he wanted to combine parts of Turkey even to Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Palestine. So the inspiration I get is from how much, like he's done a huge impact on people. And now we are in 2020 and people are still talking about him. So I aspire to be like that. So he's my ultimate inspiration. And where do I get the musical inspiration from? Well, it came from many influences. Um, my mother was the biggest influence that I've had. Uh, she was always playing music. She was always singing. And believe it or not, she was a chemist, but her creativity in chemistry and the way that she came up with many new things inspired me as a musician. So my influence wasn't from musicians. My first inspiration was my mom who believed in creativity and believed in, in enjoying passion in life. And that was translated into music. So she was my ultimate musical inspiration. That's absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that, Tala. And it sounds like you're doing exactly what your family did and passing on the baton of creativity to the next generation as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. So our next question, we go over to Tamer. And Tamer, this question is from Marie Claire Boyle, who would like to know, how has teaching been for you during COVID? As I mentioned in the beginning, it's not a new experience for us as a conservatory since we have a branch uh, on Gaza and teachers cannot uh, be there. Uh, after the pandemic, we, we are investing, uh, we invested uh, like high technology screen rooms in each branch in the West Bank and uh, Jerusalem. So teachers can have their lessons from there. To be honest, it's not uh, an effective like uh, to be face-to-face -face, uh, lessons, especially for the young and uh, new students. That's wonderful, Tamer. Well, thank you very much for what you're doing. And I know that you've been doing incredible work with our long distance learning program as well. So we commend you for your amazing work. Thank you. Thank you. And our last question that we have time for is over to Leith. Um, Leith, this question comes from Diana Safier, who would like to know how much has music helped to shape your identity? Thank you for this really loaded question. Um, I mean, I grew up in music. I was four years old when I started playing the instrument. And my, my as I said, my parents are both musicians, so we had music all the time at the house, guests coming over and I would go to concerts. I started touring from a young age. So it's, in many ways, I only know music and I don't know anything else. So it's a huge part of my identity. Um, and I just feel very, very blessed to be able to make a career out of it, but also be able to spread and give back to the community. So uh, yeah, it's just one of these things where I I didn't really have a choice in it. it um, and as the cliche goes, it really chose me. That's really wonderful. Well, it certainly sounds like you are giving a lot back with your music. So thank you so much for all you're doing. Um, we thank you all so much. Um, at this point, just a couple of housekeeping things, and then I'd like to pass back to Heba. Um, so just for everyone who is attending today, I, I will be sending out an email once we have the video of this recording available in the next couple of days. So watch out for that in your inboxes. Also, if anyone has any burning questions for our panelists, for our interviewers, for PAL Music, please do email them over to me and I'll pass them on for you. Um, but at this point, I would like to pass back over to Heba for our closing remarks. Thank you all. Thank you, Louisa.
Um, well, thank you. Uh, following from, uh, from these inspiring exchanges, Palm Music would like to thank again all our participants today, Tala, Tamir, and Leith. Thank you for joining us. Our special <laughs> guest, Ambassador Afif Safi, and to all our students, and to all our students from the Edward Said National Conservatory and their teachers, a big sparkly star-dusted thank you. My last heartfelt thank you goes out to you, our audience and supporters, without whom none of this would be possible. Please continue to support us as we continue to help our students develop their musical talents to bring music to Palestine, to the heart of each child. Thank you so much again from us at Palm Music for joining us tonight. Very Merry Christmas, Eid Milad Saeed, and we bid you good night with our last piece of music from Bethlehem Orchestra. It is offered to you like the gifts of gold, myrrh, and frankincense from the birthplace of Christ to the world at large with a message of peace throughout the nations. Thank you. Thank you.